Good morning. Good morning, Your Honors. Kevin Nixon for Mr. Marrero. I'd like to start uh, with the issue concerning the judge instructing on joint venture. Uh, the case was uh, tried with the defendant as the shooter, with the Commonwealth never suggesting anything else. There was one gun with several shots fired, and the defendant shot them, period. That was their case. You can look at the trial prosecutor's opening statement and his closing argument to see the theory of the case. You can look at the evidence as, as well and see that the, all of the evidence was that the defendant was the shooter, the principal murderer, with no suggestion anywhere that anyone else could have been the shooter. So what we have on appeal now is the Commonwealth arguing that there might have been some possibility, perhaps, of, for the jury to doubt whether the defendant was the shooter. And if there was, then it was appropriate for the judge to instruct on joint venture. And in support of its position, the Commonwealth cites a couple of cases and relies mainly on Commonwealth versus Netto. And uh, you can see that when you look at the Netto opinion, you can see that, that the facts there are nothing like the facts in this case. In fact, um, when the Commonwealth quotes from the uh, case at page 28 of its brief, the uh, crucial word that's omitted, this is in the middle of the page, is, that it is circumstantial. The Commonwealth may present strong circumstantial evidence that the defendant himself was a principal perpetrator while simultaneously presenting evidence that the crime was indeed committed as part of a joint venture. Do you, do you think um, Zanetti has no impact here because it's later? Yes. I e think e even though there is some suggestion, and maybe I'm misremembering it, that uh, there w we would use that analysis to re review the sufficiency of the evidence? I think the defendant is entitled to the benefit of the law as it stood when he committed the offense and when he was on trial. The case was tried in November of 2006. The offense was committed in 2004, I believe, and Zanetti, I think, was decided last year. So uh, as Zanetti changed the law to his detriment, that doesn't apply to him in this case, and he's entitled to the law regarding joint venture as it stood when he, was, uh, when he committed the offense allegedly, and when he was on trial. So I, to answer your question, Your Honor, the answer is I, I think Zanetti does not apply. So um, their position is oh, that tell me, Explain to me again exactly why the judge's instructions to the jury were wrong. Well, they weren't, there was nothing wrong with them except that they, they, he was proposing in his instructions <laughs> a theory of criminal liability for which there was insufficient evidence. Well, then they were wrong. Yes, they were wrong for that reason. I'm not suggesting there was anything <coughs> wrong with the way that they were fashioned, just that he they submitted. They didn't apply to these facts. Yeah, they don't apply to these facts, Your Honor. There's no evidence of any joint venture involving the defendant as in the and use the, of the firearm. And this specific objection was not raised at the time. Some, another objection was raised. Yeah, yeah it was uh, the, I mean, the evidence was clear that this was, a, that this was the case after, at, by the time the required finding motions were being argued. For some reason, um, trial counsel identified joint venture as the issue that he wanted to challenge, but argued that there was no evidence that the uh, participants in this attack were acting in concert, and that's the reason that joint venture was inappropriate. So, so the issue so is explain to me how Explain to me how your client was prejudiced in this regard, since all the evidence was that he was the shooter. Well, he was prejudiced because the, as, as the court explained in one of the cases that I've cited in the, in the reply brief, Commonwealth versus Plunkett, whenever a judge instructs on a theory of criminal liability, uh, the jury, at least one of the jurors, is likely to believe that there must be support for that in the evidence. And if you're going to have a man serving a life sentence with no eligibility of parole, he should be there only after, ha after been, having been convicted by a jury that was instructed on theories of criminal liability for which there was sufficient evidence. But, but wasn't there evidence that he was one of several attackers? Yes. So why isn't that enough to show that he was a joint venture? It's whether, he was a, it's whether there was any evidence that would support the um, claim that he was a joint venturer as it, as it went to the shooting. He's the principal in the murder. <clears throat> That's the only evidence that there is in this case is, is exclusively. But, but have we that. ever said that a principal was not a joint venturer? No, no, you are. And if, 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 there is a, if there's evidence of a joint venture, the fact that somebody is the principal doesn't mean he's not also a joint venturer. Well, that would, you could say that if Zanetti applied to this case. You could say that anyway. 
You can say that, but the law that has built up around this issue, principal versus joint venturer who is not a principal, makes it clear that the court should reverse on this ground. What happened was the judge has instructed on joint venture as it relates to this defendant's shooting of the victim when there's insufficient evidence to support that theory. The cases that support it are cited in the brief. The theory was that he was the shooter. Yes. The theory was that there were also participants with him. In the beating that preceded the shooting, yes. Yeah. So you're saying that under no theory at any point in our jurisprudence could he have been deemed a joint venturer under those circumstances? Not as to the shooting. He was entitled to have his jury charged with instructions that identified him as the principal and did not make available to that jury the option of convicting him as a joint venturer in the shooting where he was the principal. Doesn't that apply only when there is insufficient evidence of a joint venture of which he was a part, which, as I hear you saying, is not this case? No, I disagree with that, Your Honor. The cases are Fickett is a case, Commonwealth v. Green is a case. There are more that are cited in the brief. Yeah. But didn't the judge say that in order to convict him as a joint venturer, the joint venturer had to have been focused upon a killing, essentially? Yes. Yeah, essentially that, yes. So you're saying that he could not have been a joint venturer under those circumstances? Not as to the shooting, no. He was the principal shooter murderer. The other guys could have been convicted as joint venturers in the act for which he was the principal. And they could have been convicted as murderers? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Okay. So if they could, why couldn't he be if they thought, if the jury thought that he was not the shooter but simply had a role more akin to that of the others? Well, this is a theory that the Commonwealth is presenting in opposition to what I'm saying, Judge. And that would be the case if there were any evidence that he was not the shooter. If there was some doubt, for instance, Netto is a case where the identity of the shooter is built by entirely circumstantial evidence. It could be the husband. It could have been the wife. They tend to argue the case as though it is the husband. But there's no direct evidence. All of the evidence in my case was direct evidence identifying with eyewitness testimony the defendant as a shooter. But what if the jury said we acknowledge the weaknesses of eyewitness testimony and we know he was there but we may be a little bit skeptical that he was the actual shooter but we know for sure that he was there and that he intended to kill? That would be entirely speculative on the evidence and on the way it was presented and argued by the Commonwealth. There was no suggestion of that in the evidence or in the Commonwealth's presentation. Is what you're saying there's no suggestion of – you would agree that there was evidence from which a jury could find that he had the requisite intent? Yes. Okay. And that he was participating with the others? Yes, they were acting in concert. So even though there's plenty of evidence that there was a joint venture of which he was a part, he can't be convicted as a joint venture because he was the shooter. That's your position? That's my position, yes, Your Honor. He was the principal in this murder. The other gentlemen were joint venturers. It was error for the judge to submit joint venture as a theory of liability when there was insufficient evidence to support that theory as it pertained to the defendant. Okay. Would you agree that after Zanetti that wouldn't matter? Yes, I think that's true, Your Honor. And that's why I'm insisting that Zanetti does not apply to this case. I think Zanetti was – I don't know what it was intended to do, but I saw it as carving away a lot of the law that it accreted around this issue, joint venture versus principal, insufficiency of evidence regarding joint venture and principal. And now everybody's just in for the whole ball of wax. So to follow it through, let's say you prevail here. So he gets a new trial? Yes. Does Zanetti govern? Yes. At the new trial, no, it wouldn't because it's the date of the offense. And my argument would be, if it went back to superior court, would be that he's entitled to the application of the law as it stood on the date of the charged offense. Doesn't Zanetti – I mean, doesn't Zanetti specifically say that any case tried after the date of this opinion, this is what applies? Well, we'd have to litigate that particular point, Your Honor, at the superior court. 
Uh, I know what my position would be representing my client uh, at that venue, and uh, that would be it. So, um, and the problem is, of course, that um, you can see it in the, in the, on this, you can see it in the jury's deliberations. Um, they come back, uh, the deliberating jury comes back with a question and asks whether um, joint venture applies to all four indictments, meaning does it apply to all of them and the murder indictment? And the judge instructs, yes, it does. Over objection, admittedly objection perhaps for the wrong reason. So it was a live issue, I'd submit, in the jury's uh, deliberations. Uh, they resolved that against the, uh, that uh, uncertainty against the defendant by convicting him. And uh, there's no way to know whether they, uh, they, any of them, or all of them, convicted, because it's a general verdict form, convicted the defendant on a, a theory of liability for which there was insufficient evidence. So central to your theory is that you are either a joint venture or a principal, but you cannot be both. Yes, and I think the law supports that. Well, what's your best case? Uh, I'd say Green is a good case. Uh, Fickett's a good case. Um, Commonwealth versus Rodriguez was decided by the appeals court, 58, Mass Appeals Court, 610. It's a 19, or a 2003 case, excuse me. Um, and even though it wasn't a, it preserved with an objection, there's a lot of law that says the improper submission to the jury of a theory for which there is inadequate evidence automatically creates a risk of a substantial risk of a miscarriage of justice. Uh, the, this court said that in Commonwealth versus McGovern, 397 Mass, 863 at page 867. So. Um, That's my, that's my first issue. Okay. Thank you. Um, the other issues that are raised in the brief have to do with, uh, number one, the judge's summary denial of the motion for a new trial on, uh, that was brought on right, test, right to testify grounds. That was rejected by the judge with one word, denied. Uh, we could speculate as to why he uh, made that ruling. I'd suggest that the, the uh, case should be remanded to the Superior Court for an evidentiary hearing. Uh, the reason being that the uh, preliminary showing that the defendant has made uh, with the papers that were submitted in support of the motion were substantial to were, were substantial enough. Was his affidavit only correct? His affidavit and then the, the lawyer's affidavit saying he couldn't remember what happened. But this was the trial judge. Yes. And the trial judge was aware of them conferring. Yes, he was there. And the defendant was there when discussions were had about whether he would testify or not. Well, the, there was no colloquy given. The judge no didn't colloquy, but no. you know, he was present when statements were made to the effect that he was not going to be testifying. He, should, he didn't uh, get up and say, "No, I want to testify." I don't remember that uh, from the record. But, well, it was uh, it was happening in open court, right. right? Yes, yes. So presumably he was there. Well, he was there. While yeah, the, his his claim is the defendant the defendant says that he didn't know it was his choice whether to testify. He thought that this was as opposed was, to his lawyers. Is that what you're saying? Yes, that 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 was the issue raised in the in the motion. He he believed that the defense or the de defense counsel made uh, the choice about whether he should testify, just as he made the choice about whether any other witness should testify. And it was only later that he learned that, uh, in fact, it was up to him. And he said in the affidavit that he wanted to testify and tell the jury what he had told the police when he was arrested, namely that he was home watching television with his uh, girlfriend and her kids and uh, had gone to bed around midnight and uh, had uh, not, you know, participated in any way in this, uh, in this attack. So um, given uh, that and uh, defense counsel's lack of memory, memory, I wish I had a little better record to work with, of course, I'd suggest that it was uh, improvident for the judge to just deny the uh, motion without uh, hearing any evidence on it. But what evidence would, would he hear? He could hear from the defendant and he could hear from the attorney who will say, I can't remember. So yes. What, what if a judge determined that there's no value to a hearing because there's nothing I'm going to learn at an evidentiary hearing that I can't already ascertain from the affidavits? Well, we don't even know that that was the basis of the ruling. I mean, it just, it just said denied. There was no, there was, I never got a chance to even argue it. There was never a, a memo of decision written. There was one word inscribed on the motion, denied with the date. Well, that are, was it. Are you saying that the judge had to uh, give credit to the affidavit? No, of course not. No, but if he's going to discredit it, I think he should say so, rather than just write one word on the motion and nothing more. 
Well, isn't that implicit in the denial? He didn't give, he didn't credit the affidavits. I don't think it is necessarily implicit. I don't, there's no clue for either one of us as to why the judge denied the motion. I mean, I know that my brother here, you know, has his theories as to why the judge denied the motion, but those theories operate outside the record. The record is that the judge returned the motion, denied, period, and that was the end of that. It's my point that the- And so you would say that every judge in every case is required to give his or her reasons for denying a motion for new trial? Well, I think in this case, where the defendant's serving a first degree sentence, that would have been the better practice, and I'm asking for that. It's not the question, it's not whether it's the better practice. You're saying we should say it's required. Yes, I think so. In a case of this magnitude, where the defendant's serving a life sentence without eligibility for parole, I think that the momentousness of that and of, you know, his single appeal of right really require that. Because as you know, if he does not prevail on this appeal, he's effectively relegated into gatekeeper status, where any motion for a new trial would be, is not, the denial of any motion for a new trial is not appealable, in effect, unless he can prove something which is, I'm sure as your honors know, is hard to prove and rarely successful. So here we have a defendant who's been convicted of first degree murder. He's presented a claim which I'd submit is not frivolous. He wanted to tell the jury what he told the police. The judge, I think- Did his statement come into evidence? I mean, I understand that's- No, they never put his statement in evidence. No, it would have been, you know- Represented by experienced counsel, tried many, many murder cases. Yes. Who just can't remember whether he told him specifically, you, what are the words, I don't know. I don't remember telling him he had a right to testify and the decision was his alone to make. I don't remember specifically telling him that. That's right, your honor. Yes. Mr. Marrero's memory is that, you know, that he told him, that he, Mr. Marrero didn't know and no one actually told him. Mr. Marrero doesn't speak English. He's from Puerto Rico. He's intelligent, but he's, you know, he doesn't, he's not an experienced consumer of the criminal justice system. He doesn't understand what's going on. He's put his entire faith in his attorney. And it was, I think, fair for him to infer that when it came to whether he would testify, that decision belonged exclusively to his attorney, just as whether anyone else would testify belonged to his attorney. So, yeah, I think the case should be remanded where we could at least present it to the judge. And- To go back to Justice Gantz's question, and then what? Okay, he says, no, I, geez, I wasn't told that I could make this decision. Schubert comes in and says, I don't remember specifically saying that one way or the other. And then what? Well, the judge may believe Mr. Marrero after he hears his testimony. I mean, this isn't outside the realm of possibility. He may find him persuasive. And Mr. Schubert may be able to expand on the reasons that are offered in his affidavit and tell us exactly why he can't remember or what his- In his experience as a very experienced trial counsel in murder cases, he neglected, even though they conferenced in the courtroom just before they announced to the judge that he wouldn't be testifying. Right. And the case was over. He can't remember whether he really told him it was your choice to make. Something that every lawyer who's experienced knows. Well, I don't know whether, I mean, yes, every lawyer knows that. Does every lawyer in the heat of battle- In a murder case, in a murder case. Does every lawyer communicate that to his client? I'm not really sure that you can just assume that that's the case. Every lawyer communicates the right to testify to his client in every case. I don't think that there's any basis for reaching that conclusion. And I'd like the judge to hear the witnesses and decide who's lying and who's telling the truth rather than return this motion, which, again, is not frivolous. It's simply the word denied. I don't think that's fair to Mr. Marrero. And I think that it doesn't really, I think his position as a first degree defendant who's been convicted of that may place him in a different category. And I'd ask the court to extend that consideration to Mr. Marrero. I'm trying to think, 
be sure what you're asking. Are you saying we should send it back for findings or, or, for, or for reasons, or we should send it back for a hearing? You should send it back for a hearing where at least I can make uh, an effort to persuade the judge that he should hear evidence. And I can make that oral presentation and the judge can, maybe he'll reach the same conclusion. I'm not really sure. Um, your time is up. My time is up. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honors. Thank you. May it please the Court, Thomas Townsend for the Commonwealth. Under Rule 30, judges enjoy discretion, and they have a screening function in which they're entitled to discredit or credit affidavits submitted on behalf of motions. There is no less discretion where the right to testify is at stake. This Court recently in Glacken held that. Um, and the judge, we are uh, presented with a motion which relied exclusively on the defendant's own affidavit to support his allegations. Well, counsel points out that uh, defense counsel couldn't remember. So isn't that something additional maybe that should be probed in the course of a hearing or in the context of a hearing, testimony? Well, a hearing there's no uh, indication that counsel will have any better memory than he had months ago when he submitted the affidavit. But maybe the judge will believe the defendant. It's possible, but again, then we're, we're taking this to what occurs in the federal courts, in the Owens case, the defendant relies upon where disbelief of an affidavit is not uh, enough reason not to have a hearing. This court in Goodrow said that it makes no point to force a judge to have a hearing where the judge is not persuaded by the affidavit in support of the hearing. Um, but, how do we know, but how do we know from the word denied that he wasn't? I mean, how do we know that he didn't decide that even if this were true, it would not be a basis for a new trial? Well, the, the judge has been, there, well, there's two in, uh, inquiries for, for under Rule 31. There has to be a substantial issue. Two, there has to be a substantial showing. Clearly, the defendant thought, uh, wanted to testify and, and did not know it was his decision. That presents a substantial issue. I think every judge in the Commonwealth would agree to that. This, in that, um, therefore, we proceed to the substantial showing, which here was just based on the defendant's affidavit and, uh, and nothing more. Okay, but, but isn't that a reason then to send it back to make sure that the judge's reasons for doing it is that he did not find there to be any possibility of credibility in either affidavit? Well, I think it's implicit in the judge's denial, where here that is the only basis for the affidavit and for the motion. Uh, writing denial is, as this court has said, you cannot assume the truthfulness of any of the allegations in the affidavit when it is, uh, there is a bare denial. I think it's implicit that Judge Avilas rejected the defendant's contention and did not present a substantial showing. And also, if you look at the record of what occurred at trial, there was ongoing discussions in open court about whether the defendant would testify, whether the defense wished an instruction from the jury. On the second day of testimony, uh, they were talking about the scheduling, and the prosecutor had no objection to continuing the case for further day. That's, that's not inconsistent with what Mr. Nixon's saying, though, because he's saying that the defendant believed deciding whether or not he would testify was up to Mr. Schubert. So if the conversation is between Schubert and the judge and the, and the prosecutor, that's, as I say, that's not inconsistent with what the, the affidavit says. Well, I guess we'd have to look at the particular words used, whether it's a right not to testify or whether uh, you wish the uh, jury to be instructed on a decision not to testify. Um, but also there was the conference immediately uh, before the defense rested where Mr. Schubert conf conferred with the, uh, the defendant. Of course, we don't know what they said, but I think at that juncture in criminal trials, it's generally acknowledged that that's the, the final discussion about whether or not the defendant would testify. Um, and also, of course, the judge gave an instruction on the defendant's uh, right not to testify, and the defendant, uh, there is no indication that uh, the defendant objected to that, to his attorney or to anyone else. Um, but I think under the rules and under the case law, the judge is entitled to screen these Rule 30 motions to look at the affidavit to see if there's a substantial showing warrant in hearing and to deny, deny because it's not a substantial showing made by the defendant. And unless there's any further inquiry on that, issue, you, I'd like to uh, address before the Before you leave that, let me make sure. Do, do, do you agree that if, for, for whatever reason, the judge said, I believe that that's exactly what happened? I believe that Mr. Marrero did not know that he had the right to testify and his attorney did not tell him. Do you agree that that would be a basis for a new trial? Yes, because that is a substantial issue. And if uh, 
the defendant was not informed and was uh, disinformed about uh, his right to testify. I do believe that's a substantial issue. I, it's not automatically a motion uh, and a reason for a new trial because then I think it, there's some prejudicial analysis uh, that has to be. Uh, his, his defense here was that he was home and watching TV and he took a shower. Well, the defendant had blood on his hands the next day. So it's sort of, I mean, I think it would have to be a fact-specific inquiry. That the judge, if he, in his discretion, he decided to have a hearing and credited the defendant's testimony at that point after crediting the defendant's affidavit, that's something that he would uh, wrestle with. But that's not something uh, where the defendant, ha where the judge has uh, discredited the affidavit. That's not a question that he reaches. Uh, on the required finding motion, um, the evidence pre permitted the jury to conclude that the, either the, the defendant was a principal, the shooter in this case, or a non-shooting joint venturer. Um, the, the evidence placed in the gun in the defendant's hands came from two witnesses, which each of whom had uh, shaky credibility. Um, the primary witness was Miss Rosa Cruz, uh, who was with the victim immediately uh, before the victim was killed in the car. She had consumed three bags of heroin, uh, a speedball, and some crack cocaine at that time, and was admittedly high, although not as high as she would have liked to have been because the drugs weren't that good. Uh, she was ordered from the car immediately be, uh, before the shooting. She walked away from the car and was on the sidewalk, so she was not in the immediate area of the shooting. Uh, she saw uh, three men run across the street to join the two other people who were beating the defendant. She identified two of the men. The victim. I'm sorry, the victim, thank you. She identified uh, two of the uh, uh, men as Mr. Uh, Gonzalez and uh, Mr. Reyes. She did not identify the shooter. She would not identify the shooter for 16 months. Uh, she gave five statements to defense but investigators. But she said the shooter had a black mark on his face. She said she? that the shooter had a black mark on his face. Um, she also said when asked, and this is on volume two, page 126 to 127 of the transcript, what was the shooter wearing? And she said that he was wearing a, uh, a hoodie and sweatpants. The evidence showed the defendant was wearing a black leather jacket and jeans. That evidence alone would have permitted uh, the jury to conclude that while the defendant may have been there, an adventurer, that he was not the shooter because she got the clothing description wrong. Uh, there was other um, evidence, as I was saying, about her identification. It, it was a belated after 16 months, she didn't uh, identify him as the shooter. Defense investigators had uh, questioned her. Uh, she said, well, maybe he, he looked like a teenager when the defendant was older than that. She said she didn't get a good look at the defendant. And she testified she tried not to look at the shooter because she didn't want to be identified as a witness to the shooting. So she consciously looked away. This is much different than the Green case, which is an exceptional case where the witness uh, saw the shooting from feet away. The shooter was six feet away. She got a good look at the shooter over a course that she testified to five minutes, and she knew the shooter. And her identification of him as the shooter was the only evidence that placed him at the scene. But isn't there also a difference that, uh, that in Green, that's true, and that the court emphasizes that, but there's also no real evidence of joint venture. In other words, yes, there are other people in the car, but there's no evidence that Green was, and they were jointly seeking to kill this victim. And I, I would, there is some discussion of that in Green, and that redounds to the Commonwealth's right. benefit. In this case, No, no, I, I'm, clearly, I'm not disagreeing right. with that. Right, there's was, there was clearly at least four, maybe five people involved in this because there was a passenger in the SUV. Um, that was, it was a coordinated attack uh, from two sides at the same time and uh, targeting the victim. Is there anything about the, is it Gonzalez is the other one who testifies that? Yes. Is there anything, you, you mentioned um, Ms. Cruz has a different outfit. Uh, is, is there anything about Gonzalez's testimony that one could take the jury could take to mean somebody else was the shooter other than this defendant? Well, the defendant, uh, Mr. Gonzalez, uh, was identified as Ms. Cruz as one of the attackers. Right. Uh, when he was arrested a half hour later, he refused to cooperate with the police. He eventually gave a series of statements. In his first statement, he said he was by the fence, and he, he was just walking by, he was by the fence and witnessed the beating. In the second statement, he said he was a good Samaritan. He went and tried to aid the victim, because it was a two-on-one fight. He thought that wasn't fair. 
even though he knew the two attackers. And he always denied, and he denied at trial, ever touching the car, although his fingerprints were found on the inside door frame of the driver's side. So obviously, the jury can conclude that Mr. Gonzalez was trying to minimize his own involvement in the case. Um, Mr. Gonzalez had um, a relationship with the driver of the SUV. He used to uh, work for him selling drugs, and also with Mr. Reyes, they sold drugs for the same person. So uh, there was um, an affinity there, and perhaps he was trying to protect them as well. Uh, so so you've, now, you've now made your point that the government's case is really shaky. Right. Well, well, so, no. It's, so it was, what was the evidence that, that, uh, that was not so shaky? Well, I, I was trying to defend the joint venture the, uh, instruction, the denial of the required finding motion. Of course, the jury could credit that uh, the eyewitness testimony that the defendant was the principal. In addition, there was, as I mentioned, blood on the defendant's uh, hands. There was blood on his jeans. But was it the victim's blood? It was his own blood. It was a bloody beating, uh, Mr. Uh, Reyes. Uh, bled and uh, left a bloody trail from the scene. Um, and the inference is for the def defendant himself, he bled while beating, participating in the beating. So there was that's blood evidence, on his That's evidence of his participation. His participation, yes. Um, but of and th there was a um, uh, gunshot residue uh, particle on his sleeve of his coat. Yeah, which one particle. One particle. One particle. That was kind of amazing. Well, if the gun was fired in a close range as this was, wouldn't virtually everyone within a couple of feet have a particle? Well, this was 16 hours later they seized the jacket. Um, it was a single particle, which an argument could go both ways, that uh, it showed that he was the shooter because it was on the sleeve, the cuff of his jacket, or it could show that he was in the vicinity and arguably maybe the uh, principal shooter should have had more than a single particle. Uh, there was uh, an elemental tag of tin, and the particle, which is distinct to European ammunition, the Springfield police use American ammunition, tin is not present, and there was your, uh, Czechoslovakian ammunition used in this uh, killing. So that- out of CSI. <laughs> right, so this was- The element uh, of tin in the particle. Right, right, so there was um, further corroboration that uh, the defendant was present, and whether he be the uh, principal shooter or a joint venturer, that was for uh, the jury's consumption. I think, it, again, it's, far different than the Green case, which was an exception. And was case. it argued both ways by the prosecutor at trial? The prosecutor argued primarily, I would say even exclusively, that he was the shooter, but this was a backup, recognizing the uh, fallibility of the uh, eyewitness identification. So the government asked for the joint venture instruction? The government asked yes, for the, the Yes, the, the government wanted uh, to go forward on both. Um, and I just want to, uh, although the Commonwealth relied on the Nettle case, which is a uh, a good case. The better case, in fact, is the Taylor, Taylor versus Commonwealth. In that case, the victim saw uh, the defendant and three other people go into a building where a victim was uh, shot and killed and uh, testified that uh, those four people went in. And later, the victim testified that she overheard the defendant admit to the killing, that he had done the killing because the victim would not put down a telephone. This court held that the jury could credit the first assertion that she did, in fact, witness the defendant among the men go into the building, but later discredit the further assertion that she overheard the defendant admit to being the shooter. Similarly, in this case, the ju uh, jury's entitled to credit certain portions of uh, the witness's uh, testimony. They could credit the portions that he was there, he was of a joint venture, he was participating, but discredit the further assertion but, but that he would, was the shooter. Wouldn't you need, though, somebody I mean, maybe Neto, other cases. Some, somebody has to be the shooter? I mean, s do you need any evidence as to there really was a shooter? Or just the fact that he shot is enough? I think the fact that he was alive minutes earlier than dead after these five men converge on him and leave, I think it's a reasonable, and there was no gun recovered in the area. It was not a self-inflicted wound. There were two wounds, one in the back and one in the buttocks. Um, so I think that's enough evidence that one of the five men uh, was the shooter. And there was strong evidence um, based on the particle and uh, the eyewitness identification, if believed, that he was in fact the shooter. But also, the, another view of the evidence would permit the finding that he was not the shooter, it was one of the other men. It was a, something that happened very quickly. Miss Cruz was shocked at the time. She was high. She was standing apart from the scene. And she was very, very scared. And she could have made a mistake. 
And she did identify the shooter as wearing clothing different from what the defendant was wearing. So I think uh, it was either, either instance, there was sufficient evidence and it was sufficient to go to the jury on both theories. And the fact that they returned a general verdict, uh, that the verdict form only had a guilty or not guilty is not fatal as it was in Green. Tell me, does Zanetti apply to this case? My assumption is that Zanetti does not apply. And I briefed it with that assumption. I don't want to contradict the attorney for the Plymouth District. Um, I think Zanetti was a uh, reformulation of the common law. And um, if this were to be a retrial in this case, Zanetti would apply to that case. But I, my assumption was that it uh, does not apply to this case, that the prior rules of joint venture do apply. But of course, I don't want to foreclose the, the court from concluding otherwise. And of course, Zanetti would, it would, this would be no problem under Zanetti. So if we agree with your brother and we order a new trial, it would go back and Zanetti would apply? That would be my understanding and my expectation, yes. Okay. Because the trial is post-dating the Zanetti opinion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank <clears> you. <throat>